Science. Now that I have your attention, I'm going to hazard a guess and say you've heard about Homestuck. If not, let me tell you about it. Homestuck is a webcomic created by Mad Lad Andrew Hussey from 2009 to 2016. Like the brony fandom which preceded it, Homestuck exploded in popularity, and its fans flocked onto websites such as 4chan, infuriating or intriguing the populace into its madness. It is one hell of a story, with a higher word count than James Joyce's Ulysses, and equally ridiculous in prose, with references to pop culture, science, literature, religion, oddball inside jokes, horror tropes, and so much more. The cast is varied, colorful, and emotionally complex, and chances are if you went to an anime convention in the last decade, you've seen at least one cosplayer wandering around. Homestuck also has a passel of dedicated fan artists, animators, writers, and musicians, some of whom you may have heard of, and many of whom Hussey has hired on for the comic, its spin-off games, and its two sequel series, the Homestuck Epilogues and Homestuck 2. Or is it Homestuck Squared? That said, this video is going to be covering topics relevant to these sequel series, so if you're a Homestuck that slept on the epilogues and Homestuck 2, you might want to get in on that and prepare to have your heart crushed or for you to lose your head. And yes, that was a reference. Okay, to the meat of it. In the meat epilogue, Dirk Strider, the Prince of Heart and anime bad boy, Face heel turned into a full-blown antagonist. With Lord English canonically dead in this universe, Dirk was bequeathed power over the narrative, with certain god-tier powers, particularly Heart and Light, continuing to develop in strength after the creation game was finished. With the ability of narration and knowledge of the fourth wall, Dirk can easily cause most of his ecto friends and family to do whatever he finds best for everyone, manipulating them to do what he suggests, even going as far as to affect their romantic relationships, usually all without their knowledge or permission. This is most notable with his ecto-daughter, Rose Lalonde. Dirk ultimately convinces Rose to give up her marriage, her human body, and Earthsea for what Dirk envisioned. And what was that? leaving Earth to find a habitable planet to perpetuate the game that started this all in the first place. So they hop onto a spaceship and bounce. Because long, pretentious monologues take a while for me to unbox, as soon as I comprehended what Dirk was saying, the first thing that popped into my head was, Ah, an exercise in futility, then. So, when Dirk and pals actually do come across Deltritus, you can imagine my shock. Let me explain. The chances of finding a habitable planet like Earth in the vast universe are very, very, very slim. I used a half-remembered analogy in my read action to Homestuck 2 Chapter 4 to allude to this. Turns out I got both the analogy and its subject matter wrong, Whoopsie daisy! and I might cover that subject in a later video. But let me get more detailed on our two best friends for the current subject, the Anthropic Principle and the Teleological Argument. As the name suggests, the Anthropic Principle references the Greek word for humanity. The title itself represents the mounting evidence causing scientists to believe that the universe is extremely fine-tuned, or designed, with humanity's survival on Earth in mind. We are able to continue to live because of the many small, but important chemical and physical details that our environment provides. In the comic, Dirk manages to list a few of Deltritus' Earth-like attributes, or constants, that can cause life to flourish. But unless that paper is 20 times longer in length, with more listed that we can't see, there is just not enough evidence to make that call. You see, the list of constants for a hospitable planet is 122 strong, and counting. The constants piggyback off one another in a way that if one of them is missing, 
the Earth could not exist. At least not with life on its surface. Out of all of them, let's quickly talk about five anthropic constants you may or may not have thought about before. Oxygen. On Earth, oxygen takes up 21% of the atmosphere. If it were at 25%, the air we breathe could explode at any time. If it were at 15%, we would suffocate. 2. Atmospheric transparency. If the atmosphere is too thick, the sun's radiation wouldn't reach the surface. Too little atmosphere, and we'd be living in a microwave of death. Moon-Earth gravitational interaction. If the moon was too close, the Earth would rotate way too fast, the atmosphere would change, and we'd be living on water world. If the moon was too far from us, we might stop spinning altogether and would probably freeze to death. 4. Carbon dioxide level. CO2 is important to our survival. Too much means we'd burn up, but too little and we'd have no photosynthesis. Plants would stop giving us oxygen and we would suffocate. Last but certainly not least, gravity. Even if the universe's gravity was changed just shy of a duodecillion percentage, the sun itself could not exist. So we too could not exist. That's just skimming the surface, mind you. Things like water vapor, earthquakes, and even the existence of the planet Jupiter are all necessary for life on Earth. So what are the current odds of finding a planet like Earth? Well, as an example, if the universe had 10 to the 22nd power of number of planets in it, the chances of one of them being able to support life is 1 in 10 to the 138th power. That is a percentage so close to zero, Stanley Yilnats wants to carry it up a mountain. Granted, this is Homestuck, sci-fi and fantasy at its most ridiculous, where the improbable or possible at the whimsiest of thoughts. True enough, it only took Dirk and crew three years and three light years to reach a planet capable of life, while the star nearest to us, Alpha Centauri, is about 4.4 light years away, and it's estimated that with our current spaceships, it would take 78,000 years to travel there. However, the extremely unlikely event of finding a rare M-class planet makes perfect sense when you consider Dirk's fixation on a certain analogy. Before I continue, here's just your reminder to like, comment, and share this video since those are the best ways for me to survive YouTube's current algorithm. Also, if you have an idea for a future leaflet video, consider helping me on Patreon. As Phenomenal tier patrons get access to videos early, receive shoutouts, and have the privilege of suggesting leaflet topics, whether similar or not similar to this video's subject matter. Thank you for listening. Let's continue. Something Dirk and Rose touched upon in Chapter 4 of Homestuck 2 is William Paley's The Pocket Watch and The Watchmaker analogy. Simply put, Say a person is walking in the middle of nowhere and comes across a pocket watch. After looking at its appearance and discovering all the intricacies of it that make it work, what do you think the person would assume caused the watch's origin? Did the rain erode the metal into its casing? Did the ground naturally form gears and interlock them into keeping time? Was the watch an accident? Naturally, a person with some idea of sense would deduce that someone designed the pocket watch, and that the only accident in this situation is the watch's owner is now short one fancy timekeeping device. Even before Paley, scientists and philosophers like Isaac Newton and Descartes were saying similar things of a watch and watchmaker as an example of the teleological argument. The idea that every design has a designer the universe is complexly designed, therefore the universe has a designer. Now hold your horses before Descartes, Jen. I have paragraphs worth of info to refute your claims of so-called intelligent design. Furthermore, woe yourself, friend. I'm still talking about Homestuck's universe here. 
one where the universe frog was created by designers, where Dirk claims they have to create intelligent creatures to play their own version of the game, and where Dirk is very aware that he and his friends were created by an author because he can break the fourth wall and is aware of all the metatextual details. Intelligent design in Homestuck is alive and well, and beyond valid. But yeah, it took a little real-world philosophy, statistics, and science for me to realize just how much divine intervention there is in a webcomic that is in fact being written by intelligent beings. Talk about your Buddha's palm. We didn't make any new ground here. I'm not surprised Dirk is taking this so well. How wonderful it must be to realize you exist. The opportunities you can experience that many cannot. And to know, even in the craziest events of a narrative that makes little sense to you, that you matter and you can find a strange peace in your impossible existence. Because someone cares about your journey. And you're not alone. Thanks so much for watching this first Laurel Leaflet. Now you know what's going on in my head half the time. This Leaflet script is in the video's description if you want to read it for yourself, or if you're curious about my sources. Again, hope you like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you all next time. Bye! Hey there. Consider becoming a patron, just like the phenomenal Bleed Red, Alexander Madeline, Uranium Coffee, and Ryan Nelson.